Hi folks and welcome to a brand new episode of CND here on the NDTV network. I'm Siddharth Vinayak Patankar and uh, we are in a very unusual part of the world, somewhere where we brought you before on the program. A few more details of that coming up in just a little while. But first up, it is a bit of an exclusive. We want to show you a car that's headed to India, a car that many of you have wanted to know so much more about. I'm not going to spoil the surprise. Let's get straight into our top story. Volvo has been struggling to gain a foothold in India and is a distant number four in the Indian luxury car market. But with this car, Volvo hopes to make waves and capture some volumes at the same time. The V40 Cross Country is the butch avatar of the V40 station wagon. While the V40 debuted a year ago at the 2012 Geneva Motor Show, the cross-country variant was shown at the Paris Motor Show and has now started rolling out in European markets. Now, when the V40 cross-country drives into our market, it's going to have to compete with a wide variety of vehicles. There's everything from the Mercedes-Benz B-Class, which is more hatch-like, to uh, something which looks very much SUV-ish, that's the Audi Q3, and then you've got the BMW X1. Visually, this car does look a whole lot more compact than that. So it's got very different cars to take on. Let's go and explore the design a little bit closer. The V40 Cross Country adds a little attitude to the plain V40. It's certainly smart and has a tough look, courtesy not just the skid plates at the front and rear, but also the extra plastic cladding that's been thrown around. Like all Volvos, this one's loaded with lots of safety gear and so you've got the uh, inbuilt radar system back here in the grille. But otherwise, in terms of styling, the big Volvo logo and uh, the looks that pretty much tell you that it's the uh, new design language from the family. So, a little bit of the uh, inbuilt LED daytime running lights. In front though, the bumper, that's the section where you can see it's got this black cladding that's been thrown in gives it a little bit of a sporty appeal and that's where the cross-country part comes in because the regular V40, well, it doesn't have any of those sections. It's all body colored and it's a lot more uh, saloon-like in its styling. You do see that cladding pop up here on the side as well. It gives it a rugged look and it's also perhaps a little practical from especially the Indian viewpoint. Roof rails here also add to the sporty element. The panoramic roof, again, a nice little touch, gives it a bit of a high-end feel as well. At the back, again, typical Volvo styling territory. Looks, looks a little bit like the C30, but yes, it reminds you of the uh, XC60 in particular, just like the face does. But this is the section which I think is nice. It's young, it's sporty, it's very different. Doesn't look station wagon-like as a result of what's been done here. The whole tailgate just sort of moves up a little bit. You don't see the typical door clamp. It's all nicely hidden away inside. Big Volvo lettering at the back. And again, the black cladding, the plastic bit shows up in the rear bumper as well and uh, you got uh, twin tailpipes and the cross-country badging very neatly embossed uh, almost subtly down here so looks rugged looks a little bit uh, more ready for action than the regular v40 does and uh, even though it has a station wagon sort of a look along the side i think overall it has certain elements that should appeal to an indian audience especially a younger buyer the cross-country is also 40 millimeters higher off the ground than the regular v40 and that added ground clearance will hold it in good stead in India for sure. The boot is not cavernous, but holds a generous 335 litres of cargo nevertheless. Inside, the cross-country is extremely Scandinavian. Subtle palette meets practical layout. The central console is the now familiar floating style panel from other Volvos, with lots of buttons and yes, you will find a hollow behind that panel. The buttons make access to all the functions a little bit easier than having to go through a one knob controls everything kind of dial. The seats are well finished and plush and the cabin overall appears butch too, but very well built and premium. Space isn't great at the back and three well built Indians may find it a bit tight. But overall it's the kind of plushness that you would expect from a premium offering. Now let's drive it. First impression is a good one. The car with me today is the 177 BHP D4 variant. The range topping variant is the T5 Petrol, which is also the only one that has all wheel drive. A massive 254 BHP as well, but it's not likely to be introduced in India. In India, we will get the 150 BHP D3, which uses the same engine block as the D4, but with reduced output. 
It's also the same engine that you get in the S60, the XC60 and the S80 in India. Of the three petrol variants on offer, we shall get the 180 BHP T4, which also promises to be fun. And you know what? I can't wait to drive it too. Now there's a certain sporty character that comes through inside the cabin as well. Not just in terms of the colors and the way everything's been laid out, but also the way the car feels. Now remember I said the car has this uh, impression of being a little compact and taut. Well, that actually helps on uh, the drive side because what it does is it gives you a little bit sportier performance. It uh, gives you better control and a feel of something that's uh, really responsive as opposed to a regular station wagon which is usually stretched and you know gives you the impression of being really long in the back. So uh, yeah, I think that part is something that's going to appeal to buyers who want to drive the car themselves. What's not going to perhaps work is uh, for people who want to sit at the back because it does give the car a bit of a sporty character as I said and so the suspension settings seem a little bit taut and uh, people in the back may not really like that. The other thing that I do like is that uh, youthful appeal. Well, it also comes through in the kind of instruments I'm seeing here. It's a virtual instrument cluster, pretty cool stuff. And uh, the driving position, the seats, all of that, I think, uh, lend themselves to a car that's going to be fun to drive. Something a lot of Indian buyers might actually appreciate. The lack of the all-wheel drive variant won't really hurt Volvo's prospects, in my opinion. The car is agile and sporty as is, and very precise in its handling and steering too. The added ground clearance hasn't taken away ride quality and I have to say it feels more fun than the Mercedes-Benz B-Class and the BMW X1, though the Audi Q3 will likely feel more exciting since that is an all-wheel drive with Quattro. The V40 cross-country I drove had lots of goodies on board that included navigation, heated seats, both of which by the way came in really handy especially in this frigid setting, the panoramic moonroof, love that park assist, radar and camera, well, the list is pretty endless. The car also has lots of safety equipment like all Volvos. Collision and blind spot warnings with adaptive cruise control, lane departure warning, multiple airbags with in fact even the optional pedestrian airbags too. And as I said, the list then really is endless. Volvo is likely to seek volumes as I said and so I expect the prices to stay below the BMW X1s. So finally the premium market is within sniffing distance of the 20 lakh price barrier. What Volvo will need to do is quickly make good on its promise to open more dealerships and workshops and get cars on the road so people have a little bit more faith in the brand. This one's not an off-roader, it's not big and it's not bulky either. It doesn't have three-row seating. But frankly, is that what most of you would really be looking for? So react to that. Now we want to also show you the BMW X1. Now that car of course has been in the market for some time, but interestingly, it actually takes on the Volvo V40cc. It's the same space, isn't it? A space that's been created in many senses by the X1 and then uh, also by other cars like the Audi Q3 that exists in the market. So let's quickly take a look at the refreshed version of the X1 that's coming to our market. In fact, just launching in India in a few days' time from now. Here it is, the brand new, updated and facelifted BMW X1, exclusively on CNB. This is the German spec S-Drive 20D, meaning it's the four-cylinder, two-liter diesel, which is, by the way, the only engine we will be getting in India on the upgrade as well. BMW launched the X1 in India at the end of 2010 and it was an instant hit. The car offered seemingly everything that people wanted. A step into the BMW brand at a price point starting from 22 lakh rupees. But after a massive sales rush, 2012 saw the X1 start to slow down by the end of the year and the rivals started to flood in, which is why a refresh is important at this stage. You've got to look a little bit closely just to try and understand what's really changed about the X1 because at first glance you're not going to pick it up. However, superficial changes, that's pretty much what a facelift entails and so that's what you're pretty much getting as well. It's here, it's a nice mature looking headlamp cluster compared to what you used to get. The uh, LED treatment inside for the daytime running lights has changed a little bit as well and uh, it's more akin, if you will, 
to the uh, X3, so uh, slightly bolder face up front. In fact, that's pretty much true of the uh, overall styling up front. Now, the X1 did already have the new look in terms of having the large grille, but the uh, headlamp cluster certainly looks a little bit more upmarket. Along the side flanks, you pretty much see the same thing. However, here you get a little bit of an extra. There is uh, the inbuilt integrated indicator that's been added in. Now, most other cars which try and go crossover, they try and add all these plastic elements. Now, on the X1, that's actually gone down just a little bit. We've managed to get this car a little bit muddy, but uh, that's, of course, what the car is all about. However, we're still not going to get the X-Drive, so no four-wheel drive. It's going to remain the S-Drive as far as India is concerned. At the back, too, you can't really pick up on any big changes except that the taillight treatment has been refreshed and looks a little bit uh, stylish as compared to before. And given the fact that this is the entry car for BMW buyers in India, for people who want to step into this brand, looking a little bit upmarket certainly helps. The car looks bigger and sexier now, and yes, more like its sibling, the X3. The new headlights in particular, bold and exciting. Not much change as far as the overall layout of the cabin is concerned. It's still not as upmarket. You're still not going to get the uh, six-speed automatic gearbox. Of course, the car I'm driving today is the six-speed manual. I wish you got that in India, but we don't. This particular car has uh, been kitted out with these nice sporty seats with red stitching. Now, some of the M package as well as sportier elements, that's what's been thrown into the X1. And so, look at the way this whole thing looks over here with black, a little bit of this brushed metal look. The features are still the same, but it just all looks a little bit chunkier and sportier. However, in India, remember, people might still like to see a little bit, little bit of wood, a little bit of tan and beige interiors. So you might still get those options. We'll have to wait for the India launch to know exactly what's changed on the inside. So it's not a massive change inside or out, but it's enough to qualify as a facelift. BMW has chosen to plonk in just this one engine, as I said, that we pretty much had earlier too, didn't we? And no, the gearbox hasn't been upgraded either. Now, BMW hasn't made any mechanical changes. It's just a facelift in the pure sense of that. And uh, so the good news though is that this is a car that was known for its fairly sporty driving dynamic. It's something that held it in good stead in global markets as well and uh, in India too. But uh, of course, remember that that also means that it still remains very much a user-oriented, a driver-oriented vehicle. And so uh, there aren't really too many changes at the back. So of course, there will be a little bit more of an upmarket or a plush feel for those who do want to sit at the back. The car is then still fun and athletic. It's too bad BMW won't bring in the X-Drive or the all-wheel drive version anytime soon. Prices though will be the key point to watch out for and it is likely that the petrol variant mainly brought in for its lower price point in 2010 will also now bow out of the Indian market. More on the new 2013 BMW X1 when it debuts in India next week. So we are in northern Sweden, very close to the Arctic line and uh, I can tell you that uh, some of you I know do remember uh, that we came here before for an Audi driving experience. So we'll show you the details of the actual experience on the program next week. But for those of you who don't remember that story, let me quickly show you the surface that we're driving on. It's solid packed ice. It's about 70 centimeters thick, sometimes perhaps about a meter thick. And so it's a little disconcerting to know that there's fish uh, swimming around below you. but. We are assured that uh, the ice won't crack and that we won't go through, but <laughs> how do they prepare this surface and uh, what are the different driving exercises here and uh, how does it help actually try and better your skills to control the car? All that, like I said, will be on the program next week. Now, we've shown you a fair amount at the top of the show, but there's still more coming up, which means that uh, you have to stay tuned. It's a short commercial break that I'm dipping into and uh, I'm also going to dip into the car because the temperature here has dipped to about minus 9 degrees now. I have to warm up. See you on the other side. Welcome back to CNB. We're coming to you from the frozen winter wonderland of northern Sweden this week. And uh, we are here for an ice driving experience. The experience though is something I will share with you on the program next week as I mentioned already. The focus on the show right now shifts to two wheels. The first story that comes to you is a brand new product that rode into the market a few weeks ago. It's one that's uh, gotten me pretty excited because it might just change the game or change the dynamics for the entry level of the Indian motorcycle market. It is the Discover 100T from Bajaj. Here's our review. Mm -hmm. 
It's the most promising launch in the entry segment of the Indian motorcycle market in some time. Bajaj has famously been the company to swear off the 100cc space once and now offers several products in the category. However, with the Discover 100T, it's gone where pretty much no one else has, at least in the Indian context. The Discover 100T is quite simply a premium 100cc bike, an oxymoron in some ways. But just like hatchbacks are no longer dowdy and uninteresting cars, well, an entry bike needn't be down market. Here, here we go. Bajaj has bought down the Discover 125ST's rather impressive engine to create the 100T's heart. The 10 bhp though is definitely a step up from its rivals. The 5-speed gearbox has an all-up shift pattern which is comfortable. And while the bike's curb weight at over 120 kilos was worrisome, the power to weight ratio remains the best in this class. The 100T accelerates evenly and fairly smoothly, but over 60 km per hour, a slight vibration creeps in. It's beyond this speed that the bike seems a bit reluctant to accelerate as quickly as before too. Now the T in the 100T stands for Tourer, which is uh, somewhat akin to the ST, which is a sports tourer. That's of course the 125cc Discover. And uh, the idea is to focus on comfort, on efficiency, and on making this bike uh, a whole lot more fun to drive than what some of the earlier bikes have been. So I can tell you that performance is pretty decent and comfort also works. Bajaj has taken a gamble but we think it's a smart one. No one has tried to do anything different to the original Splendor for the most part in this segment. Sure, we got electric starts and alloy wheels every now and then, but the equipment on this bike, plus its near 125 ST looks, will compel the buyer to think more about style, appeal and performance even at this end of the market. At just over 50 grand, it's not cheap to buy, but spread over an EMI, the extra 5,000 rupees over the plain Discover 100 may seem well worth it to the younger buyer, or one who wants just that little bit extra. Here's hoping the rivals only try and best Bajaj's efforts. Time to broaden our horizons. We always like to mix things up here on CNB and bring you a few special stories. Vishnu Shom, my colleague, who of course, if you remember, also is another car nut, has been uh, looking at uh, a very different kind of transport. We are talking about the Aero India show in Bangalore. Vishnu is there to check out uh, some of the interesting things that are on display and uh, here's something that he felt we should actually bring you on CNB as well. In just a few months, this jet, the gigantic C-17, will be flying over the skies of India. In fact, the first of 10 C-17s which are being acquired in a $4.1 billion deal is already in IAF colors and is in flight test in the United States. Today I would be among a small group of journalists to get a ride on the C-17 at Aero India 2013 above the skies of the Yelahanka Air Base near Bangalore. The C-17 can lift 77 tons of cargo. It can fly non-stop for up to 12 hours and with air-to-air -air refueling it can fly much farther. Capable of landing on desolate airstrips the C-17 is the workhorse of the U.S. Air Force in all its theatres of conflict, including Afghanistan. This aircraft, how it's changed mobility operations across the globe cannot be understated. Years have passed, if you wanted to move a large volume of equipment, combat supplies, humanitarian supplies to austere locations, you would have to take a big cargo plane like a C-5 
unload that and put that on smaller cargo aircraft. This aircraft has a capability of bringing a great deal of supplies from a large urban metropolis airports to uh, locations, dirt fields, mountain, mountainous areas where you wouldn't have to make that transfer with smaller aircraft. It can do it all. It's a strategic aircraft, it's a tactical aircraft. When you take a look at the unique capabilities of this aircraft around the world, whether it's in everyday uh, support operations, operations, combat operations in Afghanistan or Iraq, or humanitarian operations, and that's where we've made a lot of money in this aircraft, with humanitarian operations throughout the Asia Pacific. Landing a C-17 is no ordinary experience. In the places the jet operates, there is no luxury of lengthy runways. The C-17 descends fast and comes to a full stop in just a few hundred meters and can in fact move backwards by reversing the thrust of the direction of its engines. Well, that's about all that I could pack into this one show and uh, it's a lot that we've actually shared with you. So please react to everything that you've seen on the program. And uh, remember that next week, that entire huge mass of uh, frozen lake that you see behind me, well, that's going to be our playground. So you've got lots to look forward to on the program next week as well. Whichever part of the world you're in, whatever the surface, please wear your seatbelts, please wear your helmets. I will see you on the program next week.